we're on YouTube now. Webinar is now streaming live on YouTube. So, Emil, we are on. I'm going to try and do the introduction. Um, hi, uh, this is uh, Frankie Anderson and Emil Volk in conversation this Sunday afternoon. Um, we're flying live to you from Australia and from Cornwall which is uh, not a part of the United Kingdom, so I understand. <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, we're, of course, in the evening. And we yeah. are in the evening. We're nine o'clock in the evening over here. Nine o'clock in the Same evening. Same day. Yeah. Amazing what we can do. So I'm, so I'm supposed to announce first that uh, this, this webinar is being brought, brought to you by, by Zoological. Zoo, zoological, which is organised by the wonderful Dave 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 Spathaki and Sasha um, Gos Goslin, who are doing a wonderful job to connect uh, lots of people who have been busy in their own worlds with their own companies and doing their own thing. And what what I'm I'm just so enjoying the fact that they are bringing us all together. Some of us after many 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 years. Um, so there, there are people who, who have um, uh, um, so, uh, made, made a regular donation through pa Patreon, uh, and they, they are Duncan Cameron, Ricky Jacou, Piero Grandinetti, and Zandra, um, to support this, this one wonderful work, which, which I do believe could be a wonderful archive of 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 our genre of work um so we're so we're here to uh, uh to be in conversation for for the next hour um and oh there's 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 also a um website zoological dot i i e where you can find credits and video links um, and I'm supposed to encourage you, the audience, to use the Q&A button to to ask us ask us questions. That's that's the one that, that I'm going to be picking up questions from. Um, OK, so I think we're ready to begin. Emil, thank you. Uh -huh. for, thank you for joining us on oh. this. Um, on this wonderful event <laughs> my pleasure we've 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 just had a little bit of time to to re to reconnect together after something like 45 years <laughs> since <laughs> we last met um and uh, we're still alive never able to meet each other <laughs> we're still here we're still doing still it <laughs> And uh, just, just, just uh, to to in, introduce us. Um, I don't know how to introduce myself, so I'll start with you, Emil. Um, I first met met you at what is called the South Island Workshop, which is a children's arts and crafts workshop in Lambeth, London. And uh, I, I was probably pregnant or in my last year at teacher training college. And you came into this riot of a workshop with the most mis misbehaved kids that I've ever seen. <laughs> they refused to listen to anything. They just came in and ran around like crazy. And I was teaching dance there. And you came to give a, give a talk and you, you, um, you, you address the kids in such a manner that they all sat down and were quiet and absolutely paid total attention to you. And I sat there going, how does he do that? How does he do that? <laughs> how did I do that? I can't yeah. imagine. Yeah. God. And so, so, so for me, you, you, you were an icon of how to command a space. From that, from that, from that point, and then we were both working in in the Oval House Theatre um, Centre together, where you were with the People Show, and I was with Selector Bloom Band, mm -hmm. um, with Johnny Melville, and um, and then we kind of went off in different 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 directions, and re met met again some year, year, years later uh, at at Reg Bolton's. Circus school, the first circus school, circus school that Red Bolton yeah. ran up in Edinburgh. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's 
an introduction to us of where our, our paths have crossed in, in the past. Right. So, so if, and you're not going to introduce yourself because so many years ago, and my memory is completely shot. So I would not be the best person to introduce you, frankly, except that you have been absolutely, you know, present on and off in my life for many, many years. So it's uh, so remarkable to see you now and to be able to say hello. And I'm looking forward to doing this with you. Mm. Fantastic. Okay, so maybe uh, what I'm expecting is that people will learn more about us as we converse yeah. together. Yeah, and they, and if they want to know something specific, then th then they're welcome to ask through the Q&A click box. OK, so my intention for this conversation, I like I like to have a, have a focus is to um, to look at what what the difference is between the world that that we creatively en en entered, where, where we grew our our creative muscles. Um, and the world that we find ourselves in now, because it's very different now to how mm. it was when when we were finding ourselves in 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 the theatre theatre world, theatre circus world. Um, so I'd like to ask you something about where you feel your roots are. Well, this is a. Uh, uh, well, I think it's very exciting for me to even recall where my roots come from because I'm a New Yorker, but I left with my dad at the age of six and he came to join the Royal Opera House Covent Garden as a principal parator. So in fact, I grew up my early years, I grew up sitting in the box of Covent Garden and watching, um, watching opera singers and ballet dancers. And that was very much part of my uh, kind of exposure to the performing arts, if you like. It was classical, of course, and, and my, I mean, everything was about voice and talking about voice and uh, getting things done. But my father was different in the sense he was a very physical performer. Mm -hmm. And um, so he was one of the few singers at the, because I'm a, first of all, I'm going to say it was after the wars, 1952, and it was quite, the war was still quite present in some terms of the bomb sites and I remember playing on the coal heaps and London was a mess. I mean, Notting Hill, you know, you wouldn't pay to get a place in Morning, but I mean, you, you know, you know, they'd have to pay you to, to, to go and live in Notting Hill. I mean, it changed beyond belief and it's the same thing in a way in the arts. It's changed beyond belief. So um, I grew up in that atmosphere. And uh, my first voice lesson was with a man called Edgar Evans, and I did a couple of scales, and he went, oh, it's not your father's material, is it? It's not your father's material. So I became a mime for the next 55 years. And I, well, I do speak on stage, but I'm in for a long time. I didn't uh, dare. But I mean, the thing was that I then got into mime, into physical work, and I went to, uh, I went to Paris and studied with Etienne de Croo for about a year and a half and You're then also well, yeah and also with people that were very influenced by Grotowski you know which was incredibly physical painfully physical and yeah. uh, I, I went to go to Lecoq originally when I went to Paris and it was so expensive I did a U-turn on the first day I mean I couldn't begin to afford it it was just, uh, and so Etienne de Croo was like eight francs a lesson, and that in a way taught me about the accessibility of great teachers. It's mm -hmm. really, I mean, um, a teacher told me that there was a greatness in terms, is in, in many ways it, uh, a matter of accessibility. A great teacher is accessible, and as soon as you get these very high costs, there are a lot of people in the great, you know, you negate a lot of talent and a lot of uh, uh, ability as a result of the expense. So mm. it was a blessing mm. because I studied with the group and not with Lecoq. Yeah. And not that yeah. I say because there are many great people come out of Lecoq, but uh, it, he was an eccentric and it suited my style of lunacy. Never mind say something, but he was a lunatic in some respect. Very particular, uh, you know, he had this thing called mime geometric, which was kind of a very, uh, uh, things worked out, worked out mathematically. But at the same time, he had this extraordinary inspirational uh, presence and would abstract things like, you know, he'd do works called Louvre, Ouvre, in which uh, he'd do something like Le Contrepoint, which is like weights and uh, body movement in terms of uh, uh, duress. And you know, he was a remarkable man. It was really extraordinary. But it all started out with this analé, which was the idea, which you see in body popping, 
really body popping is yeah, a form yeah. of anime, yeah, yeah. which you yeah, yeah. you know you you uh, move things separately and you learn how to exactly and you learn how to and uh, i was never good at any of that <laughs> <laughs> Well, 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 there are quite a few crossovers there in our life. I mean, actually, you mentioned 1952. That was the year I was born. I was born right. in that post, post, post war, war, war era. But um, my my gro growing up was was with a stammer. So I I was never allowed on stage when I was at when I was at school because and my stammer's coming now because I'm talking about it. But right. but. But because I stammered, um, I wasn't able to read a script. So they would give us a script and to go, go on stage and read. Yes, and yes. Because I developed word switching, which is like I can see the word that I can't say coming. So I've I, I got the fantastic dictionary, the thesaurus, to switch words quickly and, and switch a set sentence around in order to be able to say what I want to say. If I was given, given words written down, I'm stuffed. I have to say those words, and 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 I can't use my skill. And so, so I would go on stage and I'd stammer and panic through the thing, and so I was never allowed there. So I always worked backstage with 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 the people who were allowed, allowed on, and I'd do their makeup. My my grandfather left me his. He was an amateur, um, an upper middle class amateur dramatic mm -hmm. man that would have gone pro if he'd come from a different class. Mm -hmm. Um, and he left me his his makeup kit. I've still got it. <laughs> yeah, just like my dad <laughs> too. Have they not me. gone bad? <laughs> <laughs> but I got very good at doing character make makeup, so I could transform school yeah. kids into old men and whatever. And they were right. just, I was good at it. <laughs> and um, so, but, but I was I was I was I was a gymnast uh, and and a da dancer, and those were my things. So I came up then through the Decrew route because I studied with De Desmond Jones, who was a star. Oh yes, Desmond. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, because 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 I wasn't allowed to speak on stage, and, and I actually I was a performer for about three years before I started to actually speak on right. stage. And then right. I spoke with different accents because then I could sort of I could pretend to be French and then go I I I I I, I, I what is the word so it covered the fact that I was really embarrassed to be a stammerer so I would cover it with with a different accent where I'm struggling to find the the, the, the what, what, what what is the word you use I don't understand <laughs> you know so, so I, that was that was my 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 first voice but always my body came 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 first and. And, and I can't remember scripts either, but I understand you had trouble with formal scripts oh, with, with, a, wow. with a different form of di di dyslexia. I understand stammering is a form of dyslexia. Right, right. Yes, I, I couldn't really... Here I go now, but learning words was immensely difficult. It was, and I'd, I could never learn them unless they were put in context and with moves. And then I could get some handle on actually what the script was said. And often I could, I mean, my dyslexia was one about being able to read fine. I could sight read fine, but I can't, I'm not absorbing anything that I'm reading. So as a result, in those days, you had the common entrance, which was like to get into public school, which was a sort of posh, you know, and I got 0% of my common entrance. I mean, because not because I was stupid, it's because none of the questions were answered correctly. So, you know, that that further pushed me into this kind of field where I could find a voice um, uh, that, you know, was not of a, a mainstream or, of a, you know, a, it was in the arts. It was, it was something where it took notice of things that are not to do with intellect necessarily oh, it is of course to do with that too but i mean you also have a chance to approach things in a very intuitive and instinctual way which mm. seemed to be the way i could i could do it you know and approach mm. it and i've been living i suppose as a professional now all my life really as a result of uh, a certain ability which even surprises me to be able to to work you know in uh, in fields that uh, that allow my form of approach and expression. And I've done some directing now, and God help the people that are directed by me because it tends to be chaos, but it seems to work out okay in the end, you know? I mean, uh, uh, when it gets in front of the audience, they all start speaking to me again, the cast, but, uh, you know, yeah, to that yeah, point, yeah. it can be very difficult. And I really do appreciate the, 
that you know there are some kind of formalities and it's good to have an intellectual and planned approach to things and i have been lacking in a way to a degree having mm -hmm. that but i have an intuition that can sometimes push it through with people that suddenly respond and say i see what the man's getting at now mm -hmm. you know so I have been able to do some very nice productions so, lately. I think a lot of what what our um, generation was doing and creating came out of that chaos. It was a kind of an order out of chaos. Right. That, right. that we were we were particularly good off. Maybe be, be, because we were coming out of the chaos of of the war. That that's what yes. we were born to. That that, that that there was this that there was this acceptance that life was chaos. A bit the same as now. Nobody yeah. knows yes. what's going to happen or why we're in the position we're in and what's really going on and and who's really running the show and who's going to win the war. Is, is the disease right. or the or, or or this group or that group? What's going on? And so that's yeah. kind of chaos of like no it's a wonderful time of people not not being able to say i know mm, mm. and i think that we were very in a similar place I think where we right, came right. from yes was a not knowing and and that also opens people's minds, doesn't it? If people, when I think of the People Show, which whose work really blew me away when I first saw it as a member of the audience, you know, and it was not nothing like anything I'd seen before. And there was a following because, in a way, people were craving that sort of approach that was not what was always anticipated or orthodox because times were unsettled i think you're, you know in that sense as times were unsettled it shakes the certainties up and allows an openness in in in, in creative people in those that are not afraid of that it allows a kind of openness that mm. gave us a following that we could uh, sustain for many many years so it was 3 years ago the people shared its 50th anniversary which is sort of a really remarkable you know there's something else as well that 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 coming from a bodily experience rather than a thought or a formulated um, experience this this the, the 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 what i see see now is a very strong emphasis on 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 thinking with with actually being heavily balanced with mindfulness which is about not thinking <laughs> it, it's right, an interesting right. juxtaposition but but i do believe everything that if you push in one direction you have to have the counterbalance in the other the, the other direction the more you go there the more you know the stronger the light the mm. the deeper the shadow kind of yeah. kind of thing yeah. but but there's something about what, when i um entered into the mind training was the, it was like completely learning a new language not just a of not it's getting out of the language of words one word after another and into a language of image right of of of, of evolving images to tell a story which is which was not in you know it's like what images do you need to put mm. together for people to mm. have this the experience of this story yes yeah I think uh, I, I think that's most probably was the appeal of some of the work I, I saw in the 60s and 70s was it wasn't verbally based or, you know, textually based. It was something uh, that was very visual, like IOU or uh, Futsban or, as you say, I mean, it was uh, Futsban was more textual. I mean, no, but, mm -hmm. but, um, but 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 uh, the IOU experience also mm -hmm. was another one that really, that mm. really uh, shook me because it was so and as you say you could sort of say you said that foot barn came from the cornwall from the earth it's the yeah. same with iou somehow it just represented yeah. Yeah. and was unique to that area Absolutely. and to that culture yeah and that's something that is of course much rarer today because uh, things are so much more diverse and global so I think in, in some sense that sense of regional and uh, you know work that sort of springs from the quality of the of the area of the earth around there of the traditions that go way back in the way they survive and cope with their lives you know that's something that is really remarkable when you see it created by groups that contain that approach to their work. Mm. 
I remember seeing that wonderful documentary where the Chinese acrobats, most of it came from farming, you know, farming skills. Mm -hmm. And that was really wonderful. There was a wonderful doc about that, you know, balancing. And, you know, you see that people balancing the market like five or six baskets high. Covent Garden was like that. The people in Covent Garden that did the vegetables balanced baskets three or four high on their head. We think that now as being an African uh, thing. But it was very much um, an English feature of Covent Garden. They were brilliant. And the meat carriers. And Incredible. I mean, you know, you go, wow. And those skills uh, somehow can be transformed in what you say, circus, you know, circus skills. Uh, remarkable, you know, supporting, yeah. bearing. Well, the, my my te teacher who died before I got to be able to learn from him, but was Rudolf von Laben. Um, he, he used to create these uh, dance dramas, I suppose you call it community theater now, but um, he would go into a town and look at all the skills that people had from the work they did and then create this huge dance drama oh, out with, oh. by, by saying, well, you're, you're the baker, you've got this, this skill to oh, need oh. And to and to and and pushing in and out the ovens that you've got those right, right, movements. Right. So, so, so we're going to celebrate the movements that you've been trained all your life in, and uh, uh, and make make a dance with it. And then the blacksmith who does this movement all the time. All the time. <laughs> yes, right. So, so it was a wonderful celebration of of turning turning a light on to what people already can do in their yes, natural yes. life. Yes, so again, that great. extension of the farming skills. We've got two um, the questions, uh, are we? questions coming in from the same person, and it says, what would you suggest for people who are beginning now to engage through performing if you, if you have a problem with learning script? Well, um, well, I had this problem, and I'm just trying to think really through my own career, how I cope with it. Uh, um, it all depends on what you, I mean, in a sense, I felt that scripted work didn't suit me. I felt uncomfortable with it, and I had a gift for movement. So, I mean, it, it, we're talking about those gifts that you kind of naturally have. There's something that you feel comfortable with. And I most probably, if you can pursue the ele that, that, that element of yourself in work, and find people that uh, either have started working or have groups that work in ways that appeal to you. Perhaps that's the way you, you begin to make an opening mm -hmm. or even start your own kind of idea of, with people that have a, a similar problem with text, but try and find those that have a, a, a common element of uh, what you find a problem. And, uh, I, I think also you give it a good crack at text at times and and, uh, and try and understand it and go to someone that really loves text and loves and loves and loves words and loves language. It's those people that you find have a passion about their work and about what they do. You find a sort of similarity that no matter where you are placed, there is the similarity of passion for what people do. And whether we were talking about surfing, because I live in Australia now, and it's just wonderful to speak to a surfer about how he just cannot, you know, and even, a, you know, I'm talking about 65 year olds that still go out on a daily basis and uh, face, and you know, that have had implants and their hips and you know different their faces have been completely mashed by rocks and and they still pursue it so i i think it's really the search of people that love what they do is also a wonderful motivator for finding what you how you want to perform and what you want to perform i think that's that's yeah. it really i suppose for me um working with a script is when I tell a story that I've told before. I already know the story. And I hear a lot of people who will, um, in normality, who will tell the same story again and again and again and again, um, because it works. And that's what I would call, call a script or anything where I speak, um, oh, this is what I say when people ask, ask me that, then, I, then my script comes out. That's my personal script. And, uh, and a written script is, is the same thing. So it, mm. 
if I can connect to the part of me that uses my own script, then that's the part that can work with script. Whereas most of my life, I'm making it up as I go, go along, which is what I usually do on stage as well, because that's what I'm really good at. Because actually for me as a stammerer, script was, is the most difficult thing. Mm -hmm. I asked Dave what I was supposed to say at the beginning, just before we went on because I didn't want time to have to fret and build up tension about having to say something that I have to say script <laughs> because that's my worst my worst fear and the more I build up fear the more likely I am to not be able to say it <laughs> so I think looking at the fact that we already live a lot of our life in script in scripted and we and we live a lot of our life a spontaneous improvised vocal, vocalizing and if, if 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 we look at how those two sides of us work and don't try to put the improviser in the scripted side but actually go okay this is who i am when i'm working a script and if i start from there then i'm then i'm more likely to be able to remember it right so two personas really your script, well, yeah, your script I'm, persona I have and a million your... personas. <laughs> 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 but I think yeah. I think identifying the part of us that can already do something, same as Laban going going in, into the villages and towns, and identifying yeah. what you can already do. We already have these talents. Yeah, he was wonderful. Yeah, and that's absolutely. the starting yeah. place. I think that that was the que question: is how would you you begin? I'd start with. The fact that I already have a talent. What do I already remember? What do yes, I quote? Yes. What when do I speak speak a script? And yes. then oh, I'm actually good at that. Okay, <laughs> and then allow that part to to, en to enter in. But a second question here: How much has nature been involved in your life of performing? Well, I suppose I, I have to think about if you mean by, by nature. Uh, in terms of uh, wildlife, forest, I mean, that kind of uh, that kind of environment. I'm such an urban boy, I'm a bit like the perfumes. How much is perfume? You know, London, New York, Paris. And uh, it, it's sort of so all my stuff has been very, very, in a sense, learned through incredible artifice. I mean, opera, you can't get more artificial than opera. I mean, in the terms of the, the way the voice has worked and, uh, and this extraordinary, very theatrical presentation that costs a fortune, that is uh, anything but what uh, a simple, you know, a simple production that can do be done on a soapbox and like or IOU or as you were saying, foot fund that's brought from the region and brought from the, brought from the essence of what where they live and what the country and the culture is um I, i've had very little to do with that and then that's why i'm so much in awe when i look at somebody like iou um and uh, I, I it's so different when people show too was a, a kind of in a sense an urban group but in a very different way it was a london-based urban uh, urban situation although although there were performers that had come from the regional areas, but it felt to me like it could only really exist in uh, a, a, di a diverse situation that a city offers. Because I mean, I remember when I was working there, we had this Mexican uh, uh, called Jose Nava, who was a sculpture and fantastic with color. And uh, our wonderful saxophone player was from Pakistan, you know what I mean? And uh, Mark Long, who founded the group, was a you know, London Cockney boy. I was from New York and very physical. And I, so we managed to find a way with all these disparate elements to make a cohesive whole. And that for me, is comes through collaboration and discussion with the people you're working with, not with the director coming and saying, this is how we're going to do it. That's the big difference. And, and that comes through, you know, much more through scripted work from, which is fantastic. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying, I just am amazed when I see brilliant actors working a script and, uh, and um, informing themselves about character and possessing a character. It is really awesome to watch. But it's a different sort of approach. Mine is one of not going necessarily in an orthodox direction with a narrative or with a, you know, something that's, it's nice to make audiences work in the sense of not knowing really what's happening, but it's appealing to something inside them that they don't quite understand. And 
I've always enjoyed watching those sorts of presentations. And that can be in the verbal piece too, but so I haven't, in, your, in short, I haven't really had um, much to do with nature so I, that I could say that it's impacted my, my work, except mm. those that have had and the influence they have given me. Yeah. I suppose for me that, that uh, I, I recognize quite, quite quickly that um, the, the, the quality of work that was being produced depended on where where I was and where the people producing it were. I mean, knee-high knee the theatre who, who took over the slot of Footspan here in Cornwall. Um, the Cornish people here know if knee-high made their piece in Cornwall. Regardless of who's playing, they can have the Cornish mm. actors, but if they made it in Battersea, it's a Battersea mm. production. And it can have all the elements and all the tricks and all the beautiful things that, that, that Nehi does. But the Cornish people will come and see it here and go, very good, but it's not proper Nehi. <laughs> it's not a proper <laughs> Nehi. They, they, they can feel it. And when it's made here, which yeah. they, I think Nehi get, gets it because they begin a lot of their shows here because then then it cut that then the, the whole feel of it comes out, out of the land, the land here. And I noticed the difference between when I li li lived in London, what, what was made in London, and if I then did, did, did a camp out in the countryside. Just the phenomenally different work. Phenomenally different. Mm, mm. Um, and if I, if I rehearsed in the park as opposed to in a hall, again, phenomenally different. Yeah. Um, but that also goes to what's my na nature. Can I, can I allow my nature to come on stage? And can I can I facilitate the 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 players' natures to shine on stage, as opposed to a put upon or or, or a pretending or a whatever? We are all different, and when you put an individual with their own nature and you plant it into the soil of of a different country or a di different place, those two things together make something very special mm. when they're allowed to be when they're allowed to i mean i was very influenced by peter brooks journey through 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 africa john somebody wrote was a journalist who traveled with them and wrote the story of his of his journey there with with yoshi oida and Her helen yeah, Mirren exactly. and people and mm. i just found that that journey the story fascinating because it was so about where you were and what yeah. was coming out of the ground and what was comprehended by, by the audience there. Because of course, the audiences are different and, mm. and they want mm. different things. So it's, for me, it's like, I'm totally influenced by nature because that's what I study. I study human nature, nature as in, as, as in the land and nature of the audience. Yeah. Right. That's good. Why it? Yes. That's to answer that question, isn't it? <laughs> yes. yes, no, that's good. And looking at nature in that more diverse way is, uh, I didn't think of that. Yeah, yes. So the next question is, uh, some, some, uh, Vincent wants to know, uh, what and how have you, have you, have you used de Croo and Grotowski's work in your own careers? I think um, because I never was with them long enough, I think I, when I joined the crew, for instance, the, they had a group called the Ancienne, which had been with the crew for 12 years. And uh, um, they were remarkable in the sense that you could see those that had worked continuously with the crew and were his group, so to speak, uh, doing, doing, the, uh, doing his work in a way that he he had a tremendous influence on and was not, I won't say correct so much, but, but uh, an inspiring way to see his work presented. And, um, and so I never reached those stages either with the Grotowski or de Croo, but what it did teach me was the sense of application for something. So uh, my dad taught me that too, that, that, that the, the, the sense of uh, absorbing yourself and enjoying Enjoying the, the enjoying the journey to arrive 
at that presentation on stage and then not leaving it there to continue with that same sort of passion and application while the run is on or while you're doing it or so it's always something that is is always it's a first night, if you like, or it's always the first time you do it. It's not easy to do that. You obviously get, but um, I, I really do enjoy that sense of being in the moment, uh, no matter how many times I've done it or when I'm doing it. And that's why I think vaudevillians that can keep with their acts for 12 or 15 years or 20 years, um, how they approach that kind of work, not only through tremendous skill, but all sense of a devotion to the work and a sense of passion to present it and also the response it gets from an audience because it is so good and gives them so much pleasure. So uh, those, those elements are what Grotowski in a way and what Decrew taught me was there was Decrew who was in a way a very uh, obtuse sort of personality but you did link in to this, this overwhelming force of uh, of strength he had about his work and his ideas. You know, whether you agree with them or not, you could not but be blown away by that. Grotowski only learned through a disciple of his, through a, a student of his, and, but it was the same thing when I went to see him really, you know, his group working. It was awe inspiring that sort of uh, application. But I think it's important, Grotowski, it wasn't always an enjoyable. I think you've got to keep a sense of distance that it doesn't become too, uh, you know, that it doesn't completely de destroy you if you don't do it well enough or you don't, that you find your own way as, uh, you know, because there are people you see and you go, oh my God, how incredible, you know, uh, what, uh, but in a, in a way, if you start comparing yourself to those brilliant people, you've got to really find your own way and enjoy what you're doing. And it, it, it's, uh, the people will tell you, they'll come and see you or they'll, you know, it's not up to you to think of how good I am. It's like, it's up to you to take those, you know, take take the example of De Crew and Grotowski and Lab and it was amazing, you know, take their, take their sense of um, uh, quite unorthodox passion to, to their work in a way. Mm. That's what I think. Yeah, I completely agree with you with that. <laughs> right, That's right. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, I, I must say that I was very influenced before I even studied De Crew Mime by Les Enfants du... du, du oh, you mean du, my God. But you know De Crew's in that, don't you? Yeah, you I know, know I know, yeah. yeah he, he's in it. And Jean-Louis Jean Barreau is, oh. is in it, um, who I just... Oh, I just found oh, it amazing. A great yeah. film. That wonderful scene where, where he, he's telling who the pickpocket is in mine. Yes, in <laughs> on oh, 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 this one. You I must look at anybody it. listening to this, you must see Les Enfants de Paris. It's just... <laughs> yeah, it's it is, yeah, classic, absolute classic. But I think that that's, that, I mean, wonderful that, that Johnny Melville took me to see that, that film for my education. And it was Fantastic. really an education for me to see the world yeah. that, I was, that was opening up. Because I grew up in ru rural Wales where there was no right. there. <laughs> so it was like... <laughs> right. Oh, this is it, yeah. Wow. So in that and, sense, yeah. Yeah, and made with German money, apparently. Made with German money during the war. So <laughs> it was like a lot of, the, a, a lot of um, you know, background story to that particular. Wasn't it great, though? The atmosphere, yeah. the, 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 think, yeah. the period. Oh, mm -hmm. just right. Yes. But but I think that's that's kind of something about about the artist um, that, 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 that 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 artists are outside of politics. They're outside of of being on anybody's side. They you know um, uh, um, Cecil Collins in 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 a vision of a fool says uh, artists, poets, priests, and fools. And I put fools and players. You know I think very much our performers of of our time were very much fools coming in and breaking breaking right. the rules. Um, and because I don't think today today's performers would agree that politics is outside, you know, that artists <laughs> are, because it's very geared today, isn't it? That's one of the big differences, perhaps. Yes, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we did have political theater. Um, I always Red looked at I always looked at political theater and went, and how is that changing anything? 
Yeah. You're speaking, you're actually playing to the converted because I did a lot of street theatre, so you can see what what is what what's holding an audience and what isn't. And yeah. if the politics is not what the audience agrees with, they just walk past. They're not mm -hmm. going to engage with it. So they're just pre preaching. To, I just well, that's what I saw 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 then. Um, right. Did you did yeah. you see the Bread and Puppet Theatre at all? Did I you see Bread and Puppet? They were from. They were from. I the, know uh, of them, but yes, I don't right. Know. Well, they they had a political message that was so yeah. wonderfully g g g uh, not not confronting you with the political message. You know, they were brilliant at yeah. sort of symbolic uh, puppetry that yeah. um, that was uh, that, you know that was that, yeah, underneath it. You could read what they were saying, but it wasn't of it. It was just a fascinating visual experience to begin yeah. with, and then you could kind of look below it, and then you see what they were getting at. Yeah. Uh, and I yeah. love that. I love that more rather than being confronted straight on with, uh, you know, yeah. like uh, Trump is an arsehole, which he is. But I mean, you know, being confronted. Is he? But, is he? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I much prefer seeing what's his name imitating Trump or, you know, I like I like the sort of uh, the humor. That goes if it gets yeah. out of serious. I tend to. But the political, out. it's it's like Trump. Trump is kind of the king. Uh, yeah, he, he's one of our one of our kings. And so the stand-up comedians, it's their job to be the jesters. Yes, to, that's true. To yes. to show the king where he's fucking up. Yeah. 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 Oh, oh, I could. Uh, all of these questions I could I could spend a whole hour, hour on but, but yes, yeah, they're, they're, there's a lot of few good few questions that have arisen there up. There are there. a few there's this uh, uh, one from P Piero Gra Grandinetti um, and he says Mark Shannon Shannon do you know Mark Mark Shannon? I don't know Mark Shannon no no but then well he says that, that Mark practice. Shannon has a has great techniques with with improving memory and learning lines. Well, they, there you go. Well, That's there you a very go. good useful piece of information. Because okay. I wish I didn't know him a bit, yeah. you know, a few years back. Yeah. All right. Um, check him out. Okay. And then Francis Rifkin says, "What? What was with the developing context? What was? Hang on. The things jumping around. Hang on. Okay. What was the developing context of the alternative independent theatre movement? I think there's something to be learned and changed and replaced." What was the developing context of the alternative independent theatre movement? Wow, I don't understand that completely. That's a little bit above my head. Mm. Um, what was the developing context of the alternative independent theatre I think we were chancers. We just took whatever chance was offered to us <laughs> and ran with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was that funny combination of needing to survive and needing to try and survive through something you really loved, you know, so the developing context really ch chain, very mercurial to put your finger on it, in, in a sense, only that it seemed not to be reliant on what the mainstream uh, insisted was the right approach or the right way to, it was sort of a rebellion, I think there's something to do with the idea of rebellion in it. Of, of it being an alternative, of saying that this is not the only way to see performance or to see your ideas motivated and, and become realized to, to communicate to others. And I think the, the greater the creative artist, the more they can surprise you with what is could be unexpectedly completely incomprehensible, but somehow if it doesn't if it doesn't appear, appear immediate to you, but it does in time, you you it, it, it filtrates in I'm just trying to think of the the expressionists and the the various impressionists and painters that were like Van Gogh who was completely neglected and everybody thought it was bullshit during the time he was doing it but yet he was the kind of genius that slowly pervades the consciousness of mm -hmm. our society and you see the genius of his work so uh, it's difficult to pin it's a very mercurial thing to say what's the developing context mm. of the for me if, if that's even if i've understood your question to be quite honest but that's all really i can i can think of saying about it 
and what can be learned and changed and replaced. I, I'm a bit, I'm a bit uh, at loss to be able to answer that. Yeah. Mm. Maybe that's a different conversation. Maybe. Yeah. And Sue Broadway. Yeah. Hello, Sue. Hi, Sue. Can you, can you talk about the difference between the process of performer and director? You have experience of both. And then that's a very individual thing because I, I tend to, as a, I'm a person, as a director, I tend to become part of the company. <laughs> you know, that's uh, what, what, for instance, the, uh, when I did recently, I, because I've got this strange niche now of doing opera and working with uh, elements of physicality within opera, comic. And uh, for instance, when I did the Metropolitan, the Pagliacci, um, I had a group of uh, just comic performers and they just were amazed how much I allowed them to contribute ideas. And that blew me away. I, I didn't know, I just, the way I work, you know, that, uh, that, that I, I get in with the group and I discuss, it's the people show, you know, that's what's taught. I discuss and try and try and formulate with them an idea and an approach of how we can do this, this piece of theatre the best way as, a, as what our gifts and talents are, you know? And it worked really well. They were amazed that I, I relied so much. Because, you know, in a sense that they're the ones with the skills, you know, you can't, uh, if you've got, a, if you've got a, 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 a juggler, you don't come in as a director and say, oh no, no, that's not the way you juggle. And the guy's been doing it for 25 or she's been doing it for 25 years. You know, you say that is amazing. Now, how can we use that ability and how can we use that skill and how and, in, in, in the vocabulary in which we want to approach communicating something in Pagliacci? So they, they were this group of background players, really, that really embellished the production. And it was a they, they were a big hit. And uh, I made them a, a group of acrobats, but they weren't really acrobats, but they were a group, they were called the, the Fratellinis or something. And uh, so I think I would say that I become as much part of the people and not, I, I am an outside eye and try and suggest things that I feel work, but I try and become involved in their ways of thinking and the excitement that they're involved with. And so I become really part of them. Um, uh, and so, perhaps sometimes that is not a good idea. Well, uh, Holly, Holly Stop It has come in with a question which is a good follow up to that is what's the yes. key to harmonious collaboration? Wow. I think, I think it's the respect. Mm -hmm. It's the respect for other people's knowledge and the respect for other people's ideas and love for what they do. Mm -hmm. I think that is the, that's what, what I've noticed with the people show, that's what brought together some very divisive and uh, very controversial and, up, up, and people with very opposed ideas into how to do things. It was like we did respect in the end, the work was something we all had to be part of. And even if we don't like or don't take to what they're saying, we respect that and we see how we can work it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I think that that's the, that's the, that's, I found that's been the way to have a harmonious collaboration, mm. you know, and it's not always possible because there are some big productions and stuff I've been in, you can't have that sort of harmonious, there are things that are all set down and there's a load of producers out front and they expect a certain kind of result and you're under immense pressure to achieve that, um, but I can't do that. You know, I've come, I've come a cropper a few times because I've not been able to fulfill that kind of brief. Mm. Wow, brilliant. We've got 10 minutes left just to let us know this hour goes very quickly, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Let me know. Um, I'm afraid I would, uh, Holly, I would answer that with, with a question in um, uh, what sort of conflict are you talking about? Because <laughs> there are <laughs> many, many different reasons for uh, unharmonious collaboration. And is, is, is the, can the conflict be validated as a human drama and therefore translated into play wow. whatever the conflict is rather than trying yeah. to make harmony um, way of putting it. play with the conflict <laughs> yeah. that's what i yes that's what yeah that's absolutely what i was trying to say play with it yeah. i think you, you you put it beautifully very succinctly yeah so ludwig Shuk shukin 
Shukin, is that how you say it? Ludwig Shukin, lovely, lovely name, the same as you, Emil Volk. Enid Welk, as one critic called it. Enid Welk. I won't critics, you know, they, 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 yeah. see, you know how they get names wrong if they're a bit unfamiliar, yeah. but I came out as Enid Welk. Enid Welk. Oh, Enid Welk in a review. Oh, that was wonderful. That's the best yet. Okay. Wow. Any other definition of the phrase? This is just bad mine. This is just bad mine in the context of stage performance. I don't know. No. Uh, what what's bad anything i know that i actually having studied mime uh under desmond and having to get it to get it perfect i then went through a rebellious period mm, to unperfect it um i did do a master class with jacques lecoq which is my only lecoq experience um which he had a much softer approach a much more throwaway approach to mind that although it was it was clear specific and communicable he didn't have the rigidity what i would call in larban terms the bound flow with 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 the de crew method all of it is by bound flow even when you're flying it was flying in bound flow everything's controlled and what I enjoyed about Lecoq's mime was was he could just and throw it throw it away. So I spent quite a bit of time learning to be a what the crew would say would be a mm. bad mime. So it, and, and, <laughs> yeah. and good and bad are only but good and bad are only definable by on what basis are you saying that is good and that is bad. So. Um, so a bad mind maybe is something I have got no idea what they're trying to tell me. <laughs> if if your purpose is, is to communicate something. Um, yeah. I, uh, I'm actually trying to write bad out of my vocabulary when I write things. It would be good if you would know. How, what, how, how can I say something different to good? Can I, <laughs> rather than just doing this sort of glib, good or bad, to just no. go, what actually... Uh, and then I find myself saying, it would be nice if you were, oh, nice is another one of those. Uh, uh, actually, what is the feeling that I'm actually saying that, that I would love it if you communicated the answer to this, to this question to me, rather than using those words that are kind of jump over any feeling words, <laughs> and, and, because it keeps us here. And, and I just noticed just by going, okay, how, how, how is your vocabulary if you don't use those, those words? I have to drop into my feelings, into my body, into, into something. I'll use my hands more. I'll become Italian. <laughs> In <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. That was a bad, that's, that's the bad mind, God. <laughs> this is bad so, mind. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of us were, this is again Fran Francis Rifkin, um, a lot of us were highly political and played for the masses or whatever you might call them and played with them and open connections and debate and action, not straight on. Do you know this? A lot of us. Are you talking about a lot of performers in a, in a certain period of mm. when you were or are involved? Because I mean, I can only say that, that the politics plays a much larger part in performance now. I mean, they, they tackle things very directly and as it should be. I mm. mean, as you were saying, I mean, it was uh, some extraordinary theater. I thought the market theater from South, I remember when they came from uh, South Africa to England, to London, and they played very political pieces that were just mind blowing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And they, were, they stemmed from a real experience of what they were talking about and what they were doing. Um, and uh, so I'm not to, so it played for the masses or whatever you might call them and played with them. But wouldn't that, wouldn't that bring us back to the Commedia dell'arte? I think uh, all of us were influenced by the Commedia dell'arte in some yeah. way, way, way from some source or, or another source. Um, I know that the group that I was in, Salacta Balloon Band, was started by uh, the the son of a Commedia family. So he grew up in 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 Italian Commedia dell'arte. No masks. Um, they just wear a Commedia. They were they were descendants of a Commedia family, and they were still playing. So they right. their roots were in 
in that they weren't a recreation of Commedia, they were an evolution of right. Commedia. Right, yes, big difference. And I had no idea what I'd entered into. Um, and so, so I learned this form without it having the title Commedia dell'arte. Dell um, but 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 it's but it was very it was it was it was very clear, and then looking at, at the Commedia dell'arte afterwards, finding that actually they were the news carriers. They were the ones that would go into the regions and show people what's going on and be the message carrier. You know because they didn't have newspapers, people didn't read, and so, mm. so the, the, obviously. There was a there was a political content because they were they were also the jesters they were the ones who were ridiculing to say look this is wrong this is ridiculous but but rather than saying this is ridiculous they if you go back to the um, Heoka Indians where 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 they where they break all the rules for the people to realize why the rules are there. Or mm. if the rule is broken, people go well there's no problem there. Then they can drop drop the rule. They don't need it. So the, the, the very much in the foolish players world, the fools are there to, 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 to show what is without moralizing about it, without being on any side. Um, I think that, that, that as soon as, I mean, I'm, I'm a lover of Ken Loach's mo movies, but when I mentioned, oh, did you see his late, latest movie? Most people kind of go, no, they don't follow him because they, because they vote differently. Mm. They vote differently. So, yeah, so they're not yeah. going to, you know, I've been, I've been watching him since, since I was a kid and, and I saw Kathy, Kathy come, come home and have been involved in, in homelessness since, you know. Um, but he just shows the way that it is. Exactly. And that's trouble. exactly what the market theatre did. I mean, yeah. they just showed what it was to be two black black prisoners in a cell and what the and how they confronted each other and how they were abused. And how, so it was showing really a, a direct experience that they had had. And that, in a sense, was the political message, because you knew the perpetrators, you know, who they were, and you understood that the brutality of the treatment and it was outrageous. And and it was a political statement, but not through an obvious thing, saying you the bad guy, you're, you know, you're the good guy, mm. this, this is what mm. happened to us, you know. And, uh, okay, there's quite a few there. more questions coming in and we literally, I think we, only have yeah. two minutes, one minute left. Oh, I'm sorry, all you people have come in with such brilliant que questions. And the Very last good. question Thank is from you. Sue Broadway and it says, now I can see all the questions, I think. <laughs> 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 which is which is which is quite a good place to 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 to, to draw some sort of close to our to, to our discussion yes. wow that was that's that's quite quite so good. fast yeah we yeah. must have been enjoying ourselves yeah i hope it i hope it, it answered some questions or you know just yeah. opened up some things to people who were listening yeah, me, me too. Do you know what I'm reminded of? I'm reminded of sitting by the tightrope up in Reggie's circus school up in Edinburgh <laughs> and you teaching yeah, me know. how to splice ropes. And the oh yes, I used to be quite good at splicing ropes. And that, <laughs> I learned that in the, uh, the Ancient Mariner, which I did with Reg Bolton and Church. You know, we built this enormous mast with, uh, with uh, we got some sailor, you know, marine people in to do the rigging with us and for us. And that's how I learned to splice. So that's another thing, isn't it? It's the wonderful the wonderful skills that go into presentations and how much you can learn from people is really yeah. very exciting too yeah yeah. Uh, yeah well I remember that I could just remember being absorbed in conversation with you and I just feel like I've recreated the same moments <laughs> yes <laughs> it's, that's right it's been lovely so thank lovely you very much. to read thank you all for you know you. attending fantastic thank you mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I think we're going to go off recording line any moment now, and but so. but but we'll stay stay on in order to uh, maybe dialogue a bit 